down a couple questions. Uh, first of all, I think you kind of hit on this, Terry, earlier. Um, just the challenge that we have as, as leaders. And I think in the past couple years, uh, anyone who leads in the church has had to have that moment where uh, they either gave in or like re-upped. Like, okay, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in this. And, and those who re-upped, I think, I think I could speak for all of us. We feel an increased pressure in leadership. Maybe just speak to, uh, you know, for all these years sustaining through difficult seasons. Maybe a few tips on that. I think that the, the awareness of God's call is kind of fundamental, really. That it's not something we picked up. It's not something we decided to do. Uh, I often find myself praying John 15, where it says that uh, I didn't choose him, he chose me. And you have to kind of roll that back to God. And uh, to me, it's the kind of undergirding strength for everything. And, uh, you know, it says in 1 Corinthians, he didn't choose many mighty, so he's not waiting to be impressed. He didn't choose many noble, so, you know, I'm a son of a caretaker, not many noble, uh, not many wise, not many distinguished, but you chose. And you know, you chose the weak and the foolish, you knew what you were doing. He knew, you know, he wasn't shocked when Simon Peter let him down. He wasn't, oh wow, I thought you were impressive young guy. I thought I found a leader. I said to, I said to my father, I found such an amazing guy. No, he said, you're, you're son of Joan, I know you. Uh, he knew all men, it says, and uh, he, he knows us, and he, he kind of calculated our weakness in when he chose us. He knew our frailty, and I, I constantly rolled that back to God. Lord, it's you, you chose me, you, you appointed, you've led, and I find that that is, the, to me, the bottom line, that you, you're the one. If you chose, then you can sustain, and you who began, you will see it through. And so I, I, I'm not looking internally for answers, but constantly coming back, saying, Lord, it's all from you. Therefore, you've got to see us through. I, I believe you will see us through. Uh, so that, for me, is the kind of bottom line, really. Uh, obviously, you keep on feeding on the Word, you keep on drinking, and fellowship is massive. We're not called to a lonely pilgrimage. Uh, you know, we're called to brothers and sisters who love us and are for us. And uh, so... Don't try and do it alone. Uh, share. I, I often think of that. That verse when it says, uh, where two or three are gathered, you know, people sometimes, you know, they say, it's a prayer meeting tonight. And then you look and say, oh, well, you did say, if two or three gathered. It's like a defense mechanism. But I, I love it. I love the two or three. I, 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 I've often prayed with just two or three. I love it. There's an intimacy. That you can pour out your heart. And uh, we don't have to get through alone. Uh, that's where isolated uh, pastors, you know, the one man alone, uh, somehow he's got to carry something, uh, an image he's got to maintain. It really isn't the way. Uh, so we need, we need to be together. You know, husband and wife praying together. Uh, you know, we've, that's been such a thing for us over the years. But also with brothers uh, praying uh, together. So we're not, we're not alone. It's very important. And we're never meant to do it alone. We're meant to do it together. So that sort of fellowship, we're fellowshipping together. When Peter was thrown into prison, the knee-jerk reaction of the church was, hey, we better go and pray somewhere. They didn't walk up and down with placards, you know, get him out of prison. They, they prayed. They got together and prayed. And uh, I think, for me, these have been key things. Uh, Wendy, I mean, leading is a family affair. I mean, just thinking about through all the decades, I mean, just how, I mean, just what input would you give us from a, a family perspective, like these seasons where leadership is really under pressure? Uh, there might be a few guys here who've gotten criticized um, and, and that weighs on, on the family. And that was a joke, by the way. I, I'm assuming there's more than a few. If there's not, you're doing something wrong. And um, anyway, just talk about it maybe from a family perspective. And Well, there's one incident that Terry could have referred to just now, but I remember it vividly, him uh, calling me up to his little study that he had in the first little house that we were renting. And um, he, he said, <laughs> he said uh, do you want to read this? 
and it was a letter of resignation because it had been so tough and we everything he did was opposed it was like he was trying to lead this church but he was the young guy and there were three guys who particularly were had called together a group of individuals who were Christians in this small town and they said well let's start a church and then met Terry and asked him to be their first pastor but he was kind of like well we'll hire him but we're the real authorities around here and everything Terry tried to do they opposed and after I don't know about three years of this it was like I've had enough and Terry wrote his letter of resignation and he called me to read it and I'm thinking well okay but then then Terry said the Lord spoke to him and said did I tell you to write that <laughs> and he had to say no <laughs> and so he tore it up and uh, we we there was no alternative really if God hasn't said it you can't go there you just have to keep going the way he says. And I think that's the way it's been for us all the way through. And we often quote, even in prayer, when we pray most days together. But um, one of the, the verses in the psalm says, in your light, I see light. So as you move one step forward into a patch of light, then you see the next step forward. But you don't really get to see far down the road at all. You just see the next bit. And that's been our experience, really. We, people have said to Terry over the years, how did you start off leading a movement? And we said, we never meant to. It wasn't our idea. We just did the next thing. And one thing led to another. And you look over your shoulder and think, oh, wow, there's all these people behind us. <laughs> and it's kind of like a surprise, really. <laughs> um, yeah, that didn't really answer the question. Great. But hey, it's on the way. Yeah, I just want to say uh, on behalf of everyone here, we're so honored that you guys, to get this time with you, we're so honored to learn from you and glean from you, so thank you for being here. Um, I was just thinking about, Terry, what you shared about those early days, how it felt, getting caught up in a move of God, and I think we would all say we, we long for that in our day, we long for that in our churches. Could you speak to, and really for both of you, could you speak to what it was like in those days, what maybe some characteristics were at play, some things you felt were really important to focus on that you might say to us, like, hey, you should, you should really pay attention to this, and maybe some indicators to know if it's there or if it's not. Does that make sense? Yeah? I think that's when he said, um, that's quite a, a vivid thought, you know, in your light, I see the light, I see the next step, and I don't think we've ever been very strategic in our, our working. I've never had a major strategy. I think we've been more a values movement, if you like, rather than a strategic. We know I had big strategies, you know, we ought to be in Africa now, or we ought to be in India now, we ought to be. We've never had that. I think we've enjoyed the presence of God. We've been a strong prayer emphasis. We've gathered to pray a lot. Uh, first of all, for myself, when we were beginning to plant churches, we, didn't, we hardly knew what we were doing, really. Uh, just praying with people, seeing them filled with the Spirit, worshiping Jesus, then gathering to pray. And I initially prayed with like three guys on a Thursday morning, and that grew until more and more guys. And I, I realized that early church, they were devoted to prayer. It wasn't like that's something you also do. Amen. Uh, that was their center of gravity, really. They prayed, they cried out to God. So that was a big feature uh, of gathering together, and then I, I, I misread a scripture quite early on, uh, which is hilarious, really. It says, uh, gather your men before me three times a year. Um, and it says in the Bible, they shall not come empty-handed. And I don't know why, but I read, they shall come empty-handed. And uh, it's just a mistake. And uh, I... <laughs> Some, some, my friend Nigel Ring said, the Lord, no, no, the Lord, I just made a mistake. Right? I just made a mistake. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so I thought, what will that mean? I think we were about 20 guys at that time. So three times a year we started having a couple of days of prayer and fasting. Because it said empty-handed, I thought, well, no agenda, no food. <laughs> some of the guys never forgave me for that misreading. <laughs> uh, so we just came to be before God. And they were hugely important days as we pressed on from being 20 guys. I mean, when I handed over 
the whole New Frontiers thing to the next generation, uh, I think we were 800 uh, gathering uh, three times a year uh, to pray and fast. So that sense of let's put God at the center, uh, let's worship God, let's be before God, has always been fundamental. We're not very clever, so we really need to lead into God. Uh, and that's been a, a very important strategy. And looking to see, also, I think a verse that came strongly to me early on was, what I see the Father doing, I do. So I know for some of you, I've chatted to some of you over the lunch break, it bringing in life in the Spirit into a church that hasn't been there before. Uh, for us, for Wendy and me, we used to literally say, who, who do you think next, you know? <laughs> and we used to fast and pray through a lunchtime, and we'd pray for that couple. I think that couple, they could be the next ones. I mean, that's because we're a small church, and we pray for them. And then, have you read this book? Would you be interested to listen to this recording? Um, uh, what did you think? And then, you know, within a week or few, we're laying hands on them. They receive the Spirit. Then they receive the Spirit. And gradually, people are getting used to life in the Spirit. And then we wanted to gather them in a prayer context. And in that, in that context, prophecy starts coming, the sense of God's presence. So for us, these were priorities, really. Getting the values right, uh, getting into one another's lives, fellowship. Uh, I think grace was a huge priority. Um, I think for myself, I was terribly backslidden when I first became a Christian, uh, very, very worldly, and I, I, I lived a double life for some years. Then when God really nailed me in uh, a scary way, uh, I threw my whole life in and became, I suppose, quite legalistic. You know, none of that, none of that, and all of this, and the, you know, very legalistic and very driven. Uh, and I think, you know, I was filled with the Spirit, I love the saints, but... There's always that sense of you must do more, you must do more. So when I saw grace, it just freed me. And, and, we, and the church got freed. And we became a, a, grace, a grace-filled community that knew that God loved us and celebrated. So worship began to take over. So these were ingredients, really, uh, Dylan. That I think they were ingredients rather than strategies, values that became very precious to us. And uh, that God just kept blowing on that and breathing on that. And, and to be honest, it was hard to keep up with the doors that were opening. We didn't have to try. That is honestly how it happened. You know, I'm, I'm in here, I'm in here. And can you come here? Well, I don't know. Yeah, okay, I'll come there. And it was like more and more doors opening, even across the nations. Would you come to India? I mean, I never planned to go to India. Would you come to India? And I went to a church where actually the people were, I, th I loved the people, they were fun. The leadership was very out of step with one another. And so I actually said to them, if, if the elders will all resign, I'll get involved. And they did. They said, we'll all resign, because that value of, of togetherness and heart and so on, absolutely essential. So they all resigned. And we sent out a guy, a mature pastor and his wife, and they went out for six months uh, also, and stayed there and taught week after week and raised up a new leadership. And that was one church called Living Word in Mumbai. And then they planted out Living Light and we sent out an evangelist called Lex to help them. And then they planted out Living Hope and then, and then another. If you got the foundation right, they, there's over 300 New Frontiers churches in India now and terrific guys that are leading them. Uh, and, but I think you had to get you had to get that you can't mess about. Get the first one right. Get them a good model of love and fellowship and harmony. And so it's been value. Get the values right. Have been for us rather than having a strategic uh, program. That was, I guess that's where it's been. I don't know if I've answered you, but there you go. Well, we just really admire your 54 years of marriage. You guys seem to completely enjoy each other. I wonder what has it always been like that? And, and just wonder too, like in a season when your marriage was hard pressed by maybe family issues or ministry things, just if you have anything to share with us, for just encouragement for marriages, like how you would how you would prioritize your marriage or work through those things when. I don't know, marriage felt like it took, was at the bottom of the totem pole because everything else was pressing in on you. 
<laughs> yeah, well, our wedding day, we could start there. <laughs> it was uh, quite interesting and unplanned in some ways. Um, Terry had borrowed a car and to drive up to... I, my parents happened to be living in Leicester at the time, the Midlands of England, and he was living in Brighton, so he had to drive quite a ways up. It was about three to four hours drive, I think. Anyway, on the way, the car broke down. The, he didn't know about, you know, you have to put water in the radiator and things like that. <laughs> and it dried out, and um, he was stuck. And I was all dressed up in my wedding dress, waiting, and there was this phone call, and my father took the call and looked a bit shocked. <laughs> my father was not a drinker, but he did have a tiny little bottle of brandy in the sideboard. <laughs> And I remember thinking, oh, I didn't know that was there, as he dived to the sideboard and pulled out a little tot quickly. <laughs> and then leapt in the car and drove down the motorway to rescue Terry. So at the end of the wedding, it was now time for the reception. We had the reception and it was like, well, what do we do now? We don't have a car to go anywhere. And uh, I remember my mum looking at me blankly and I said to her, well, I've married the guy, he'll have to sort it. <laughs> and um, I think that's kind of been like a motto. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> anyway, the wonderful thing was that Terry's roommate from college was at the, at the, the, the wedding, he was a guest, and um, he strolled up to Terry and he... he uh, he was doing a kind of locum pastorate in a village about an hour away, and he said, um, the, the local farmer has got a cottage. I'll find out if it's, if it's vacant. So he, he went to the phone box. We didn't have mobiles in those days. 50 years ago, they hadn't been invented. So he went to the phone, telephone box, found out that the, the cottage was available. So off we drove with Terry's roommate um, <laughs> to our honeymoon in a rose covered cottage. I mean, it was poetic, really. <laughs> so anyway, um, the thing about trust that I said to my mum, he'll have to sort it, was something that I do remember being tested from time to time. And we had hardly been in the church. I suppose we'd there about a year when we got into our own church building. And um, it was really nice. You know, I had a nice tiled floor. We had proper seats and a nice little rose and um, uh, and it was all very tidy and neat. And um, Terry started preaching about the things of the Spirit, and you know, be and he began talking about community and things like that. And after a while, he wanted to change this sort of neat arrangement. And I thought, oh, don't mess it up. Please don't mess it up. I wanted it to sort of stay predictable and tidy. Um, but uh, he started talking about arranging the chairs in circles so that we could be much more community-oriented. And, and each time I had to think, wait a minute, he's the leader here. I may not like it, but I've got to trust him. He is the leader. And I've got to go along with him as much as anybody else in the church. Um, I'm not here to say, no, wait a minute, I don't like that. Um, so I had to learn to trust him as much as anybody in the congregation at different points. Um, and uh, I remember distinctly uh, having to make that choice from time to time. No, I believe God has called me to his vision and I've got to make it my vision, which it, it is now, <laughs> all, after all these years. No, it has become my vision. And so we've been able to work together, pray together, and I, I've learned to trust that God speaks to him. So just want to put that out there. <laughs> The Columbia call, yeah. There's a guy here, you're from Columbia, yeah. Um, Terry was asked a couple of times to speak at a conference in Columbia, Missouri, um, which he went along to, came back raving about this wonderful church. The third time he was invited, and then just before he went, he got a call to say, the conference has been cancelled because there is a, a lot of difficulty in the church. Big crisis. And then the elders were kind of totally thrown and asked him to come anyway just to help him through, talk to them and give them some ideas, some guidance. So he went and, uh, and then he went a few more times over the next couple of years. 
And, um, but it seemed every time he came home again, they kind of reverted back to their despair and disarray. So in the end, he was invited to come and stay for a couple of years. I mean, he prayed and fasted for three weeks and felt God speak to him and everything. Meanwhile, I prayed and fasted and I didn't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember we, we went to London, we got our visas, and then Terry's great friend, our, our great friend, Nigel Ring, who has stood with us all these years, he came over to lunch one day and he said, so how are you feeling, Wendy, about going to America? And I burst into tears. I said, I don't want to go. God hasn't spoken to me. And Nigel very wisely said what I should have thought of all along was, well, what did Terry call you to? I mean, what did God call you to? And I thought, oh, yes, God spoke to me very clearly. Terry Virgo is my will for your life. So... Oh, all right, okay, okay, I will happily go to America. <laughs> so I did, and it was very formative in my life, in my marriage, in my walk with God, in my family life, in all sorts of ways, and I am so grateful that we came, had those two years. <laughs> Hello. So I, I was, give me a minute to process this question because it's kind of a two-parter here. So my elders and I have really wrestled through the dual identity of saint and sinner. Um, you mentioned it earlier today. And I know, like, I've been a big Martin Lloyd-Jones fan. I've spent a lot of time with a lot of Reformed pastors, and it's pretty common for them to use terminology such as vile sinners in the presence of God. Um, Lloyd-Jones was known for saying that repentance is the acknowledgement that we are a vile sinner in the presence of God. Um, I guess I want to know two things. How did you land on your position as far as not using language like we are sinners, but also practically as believers in pursuit of holiness, what does repentance and confession look like if I'm not willing to call myself a sinner? Because the PAO goes that way, I don't hear everything this okay. way. Could you come and say it to me here? Sure. <laughs> sorry, this... <laughs> The, the sound system goes that way, and I'm behind it. No, so the elders and I have been wrestling for a couple of years now with the whole dual identity of saint and sinner. Yeah. Um, big Lloyd Jones fan. A lot of the reformers, you know, use language like repentance is the acknowledgement that we are sinners in the presence of God. Um, so my question is, I know Paul doesn't use that language a lot, but what does the culture of repentance and holiness look like in a church when you're not using language like I'm a sinner? Hmm. Does that make sense? And I'd also love to know how you landed on your position. Thank you. Yes, that's so helpful to hear it this night. Uh, so, I, yeah. um, I think it's a constant challenge. I think that someone, so some would say that repentance is the culture, as it were, constant repentance. And I, I just can't see that in the New Testament. I don't see him calling for constant repentance. I, don't, I, I probably read the epistles more than anything else in the Bible. As it happens, I'm going through the Gospels at the moment, but I, I, I think that the whole Bible's God-breathed. Obviously, the New Testament brings more light than the Old. And Jesus said in his physical form, I have more to say to you. Uh, I can't say it yet because you can't receive it. Because he said things like this, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you got no part in me. And they're thinking, what? Eat his flesh? He said, many withdrew that time. Yeah. It's like you can't take it on board. But when the Spirit comes, yeah. he will lead you into all truth. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's more to come, which I cannot say at this season. So the more that comes seems to me to be in the epistles. Yeah. And Paul says in places like Ephesians 3, these mysteries about Christ have now been revealed yeah. to God's holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Things previously not known. And so to me, if you like, the epistles is the cream of biblical revelation. It's the stuff, you know, all, it's all, I love preaching. Like we have Ezra, you know, Moses. I love the whole Bible. But the cream of revelation, it seems to me, is you could argue from the Scripture that I've got more to say. I'll t when the Spirit comes, he'll tell you. And that's when the Spirit came and revealed things previously hidden, Paul says, now revealed. Yeah. And when you read the stuff that's now revealed, it's about our union with Christ, 
It's about what when how it happened to Jesus is reckoned to our account that we died with him. He says it repeatedly. Don't you know? You died with him. Now reckon yourself to be dead and alive to God. Live out worthy of this phenomenal thing. You're justified. Yeah. There's no condemnation. Yeah. I mean, these, this, is, this is apostolic revelation, if you like. Yes. And I think that sometimes the Puritans probably particularly were ever so sin conscious more and more. And, and it was almost a mark of... It's, it's really strange. It was almost a mark of holiness to say what a sinner you were. And so it's kind of constant reference to being a sinner. And then you get, you get uh, characters who you know, have been really mighty in God, but they will go back to that as well. Uh, and I, I think that it's just, I don't get it out of the Scripture. If you soak yourself in the epistles on a daily basis, you, you don't get it. It's not, that is not the atmosphere of the epistles. It just doesn't come from the Bible. But it's very popular in Reformed circles because Reformed people love to read the Puritans. And the Puritans are heavy into all this stuff. Uh, and, uh, and Paul says, I'm not, I'm not aware of anything. I'm not, in two, 1 Corinthians 4, I'm conscious of nothing against myself. I mean, wow. Uh, that's not, oh, I'm a terrible sinner. I'm, not, I'm conscious of nothing against myself. When he stands before Agrippa, he said, I've served God with a clear conscience. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a clear conscience. I've got I know th- nothing about myself, against myself. Uh, he said, but I'm not by this acquitted, for it's God who will acquit me. Right. It's like, ultimately, we'll all stand before God. So I'm not conscious of anything against myself. In other words, as far as I know, I'm, I'm okay. Now, that doesn't justify me, is the next phrase. But God himself will, in the end, he will, he will judge. He's happy to leave it there. He's happy to leave it there. The atmosphere of the New Testament isn't this constant going over what a failure I am, what a sinner. It's playing into Satan's hand. But it's very popular in Reformed circles. And I love Reformed circles. I read Reformed uh, commentators a lot. But I think it's an atmosphere that's accepted. And you, if you say these things in some places, people will come back to you. And I think I referred to it in my sermon. And say, well, Paul says I'm a sinner. But they don't, honestly don't think they think that through. I mean, I said to some guys, so was he worse, was he worse than Ravi Zacharias then? He looks a bit shocked. He said, I'm worse than I said, sorry, you said he was the worst sinner? And they, realize, they suddenly realise what they're saying. Yeah. Was he worse than that then? And he said, no, what do they mean then? And I think, you've got to pursue it, what do they mean? And then you get John Stott, who says, well, it's kind of both. And I, I can't go there either. Like, I know I'm righteous, but I'm still also a terrible sinner. Well, I know what I was. I was a terrible sinner. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to defend. I would leave me to myself. I'm a pig, absolutely terrible. But I died. And if, if I don't take advantage of what Jesus said, I'm, not, I'm ignoring the gospel. And somehow I'm trying to justify myself. I'm trying, somehow, Paul says, they're trying to go around establishing a righteousness of their own based on law instead of accepting the righteousness which is a gift of God. And so I honestly think... The atmosphere of the epistles, which is, I think, the cream of biblical revelation. I hope you're happy with that, the way I arrive at that. It, it's, it doesn't, that is, you would not get that atmosphere, I don't think, out of the, out of the, the New Testament. You get it from reading all these, these Puritans. And that wonderful guy, Jonathan Edwards, wrote about the diary of... David. 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 I mean, the guy was a depressant. I mean, the guy drives you crazy reading him. So it's an amazing book. And, and his experiences of God, the positives in that book are breathtaking. And, and, and they would say that that book's had more influence on missionaries maybe than anybody else. The upside is phenomenal. But the downside, he's like a, the next day, he's in the pit again. And that because he's such a great hero, people think that's, that's what it's meant to be like. Because he was amazing. He saw revival. But he is, I can only feel that psychologically he was given to depression. And he puts that in a spiritual tone. So he's, he's one, you know, I'm, I'm a wretch, I'm a terrible wretch, I'm a terrible wretch. And again, of course, it also, you have to, inter- how do I interpret Romans 7, second half? Yeah. Yeah. 
And again, when he says, I am, I am. Now, again, if you say, well, that is Paul then, if that is his testimony, then we're in trouble. But I was very helped by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, whom you mentioned, and he says, it cannot be the Christian testimony. That's what he says in his commentary on Romans 7. It cannot be a Christian testimony. Because he said, Paul does not say, I sometimes have a bad day. <laughs> it doesn't say that. He says, I am bound in sin. Yeah. He says some incredible statements. And he, said, I, he says that people get it wrong because they don't read what he says. His description is so terrible that it cannot be a Christian. That's Lloyd-Jones, and I, that's what helped me a lot years ago. That he's saying, who will deliver me? I'm in this bondage. But elsewhere he's been saying, you're free. Yeah. Walk in freedom. Yeah. Um, follow me, as I'm the chief sinner in the world. Come on, I'll teach you how to be a big sinner. <laughs> I mean, it really, it really doesn't work. And so I think, as most commentators, more and more commentators, when I first read Lloyd-Jones, it was almost like a single voice. Now more and more commentators coming out Douglas Moo, uh, Thomas Schreiner, yeah. these commentaries that are coming out on Romans more and more are saying that isn't, that's not Paul's personal testimony. That's, that's a way of writing. That's what, that's what the man under the law yes. would feel. Yeah. And that's what Lloyd-Jones says. It's not the Christian, it's the man under law. Yeah. So I'm sorry if I've gone down a path, we're not all, but that's, I, that's what you're talking about. And I think we've just got to keep teaching it. And uh, if, you, if you're you know, teaching the same flock week in and week out that's got to keep coming through until people, oh, I see. I think it's like light dawning. I know for us, when we first saw Grace, the church I was in, we were going through uh, Zechariah and Zechariah 3 where, you know, the restoration of worship, I think, Zechariah 3, you see Joshua the high priest because and, and, that represents worship and, and, and Satan accusing him and he's got dirty robes, and Satan says, look at his dirty robes. And then it says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Yeah. This is a pl brand plucked from the burning. And then you cross-reference Romans 8, it is God who justifies. Yeah. And so the, the high priest Joshua doesn't have a chance to say, oh, I fell over in the mud. You know, I'm sorry, I'm muddy. He doesn't get a chance, because God justifies. And it says, put a fresh mitre on his head. And I remember preaching it. I think, how do these guys keep mitres on? Because uh, I was like, look at the Archbishop of Canterbury, this silly hat that he wears. I think, how do you do that? You have to keep your head very up. And I, I remember preaching, come on, God's good, you clean robes, keep your head up. And it was like, uh, uh, I honestly think like a revelation of grace came on our church that night. And I, it's like people stepped into it and we danced and sang until about nine o'clock at night at six thirty, we're just celebrating. It's like I see God's declared me righteous, and I think you just keep preaching it. Pray for a spirit of revelation that people own the gospel and own what it says is true, because I think some of this other stuff. If you if if people insist on saying, "Of oh, course, I am a sinner," well, then they expect to sin, because yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's their identity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if you if you say, "No, I've got a different identity." No, I'm a, I don't believe in sinless perfection, and so I, I can be vulnerable. And so I often talk about using the Lord's Prayer. Don't start sin conscious, hallowed be the name, your kingdom come, your will be done. I find it a helpful structure for praying. And then you will come to forgive us our trespasses. It's not that we're indifferent, we come. And, I, and we say, Lord, I'm sorry, is there anything that I, I've offended you? Have I got blind? Is there any area? And I always feel that, that conversation with Simon Peter when the Lord's washing their feet. And Simon Peter says, you're not washing my feet. And he says, well, uh, you know, I, I, I've got to wash you. If I don't wash you, you've got no part in me. Yeah. He says, well, wash me all over then. <laughs> uh, and so I says, you're clean already. Yeah. Yeah. But I need to wash your feet. Yeah. And it's, I think that, that is kind of a... Like a you're clean, I've made you righteous, but sometimes we mess up. And if any man sin, we have an advocate. And if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. But I write these things, John says, that you may not sin. He that's born of God does not sin. It's all in the same epistle. It's not like one guy wrote this and one guy wrote that. He that's born of God doesn't sin. I write these things to you that you may not sin. 
if any man sins. <laughs> That's all in the same epistle. Yeah, and then if we confess our sins. Okay, so I'm not teaching sinless perfection. Because uh, some people have pushed it. Some people preach what is called super grace, which, uh, you know, I think they pushed it too far. And uh, they'll say things, you say, no, that's not biblical. And they will even say the Sermon on the Mount and the Lord's Prayer is not for Christians. I've heard people say that, people like Joseph Prince and people like that. They say, that's, you know, now once you're in grace, that's not relevant anymore. I don't agree at all. I think that we accept righteousness as a gift. We can still mess up. We ask for forgiveness. But we don't live there. And I think, I think the tragedy... Uh, it really is sad because I'm uh, terrific, guys. I just was asked to write a book, an article rather, for a man called Michael Reeves, who's a terrific theologian in the UK. He's asked me to write an article on re regeneration, which I, I've put in there. Now, Michael is a beautiful, wonderful man. I'm scared this has been recorded. Um, he, he put a tweet up recently about, of course, we're all sinners. And, I, and I, I just put a thing on saying, I thought we were saints, Michael. And he said, well, you know what I mean. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, I fear I do. And so I put, it in, I put it in the article, you know, and I've almost included that anonymously in the article because I think it's that casual statement. Of course, we're all sinners, really. It does harm. And it undercuts the gospel. And it undercuts people's expectation. So we've got to keep preaching it and... Uh, I don't, we, you know, God wants us righteous, doesn't want us from fooling about. So, I mean, I do pray, literally. And Wendy could bear testimony. We use the Lord's Prayer. But don't lead me into temptation. Yeah. Deliver me from evil. Yeah. Please, de you're my deliverer. So yeah. I pray often on a daily basis. Deliver me from the world, the flesh, the devil. Keep delivering me. Yeah. Yes. Deliver me. Keep delivering me. You're my deliverer. I'm expecting you to deliver me. So I could be vulnerable, but I'm not by nature a sinner anymore because God said you're not. He said, I'm a, I'm a saint. So it's believing the gospel in the end. It's, a, it's believing what God says is true. And, and I think it's not a proud statement. It's almost, it's almost, it's saying that I, can, I know I can't produce it. It's a gift. It's celebrating it's a gift. But I think sometimes when... It's almost trying to be holy by saying you're a sinner. So if I keep repeating myself, I should not be helpful. But I think that is the atmosphere. So people are kind of shocked when you say, when I say what I'm saying. But they're shocked out of a kind of self-righteousness, which is weird. Because they're saying, no, we're sinners, really. Like almost boasting in it. So, okay. <laughs> uh, Terry, could I share what I shared with you earlier? With the, what I shared with you earlier? Because I think this is yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I was talking with Terry earlier. Uh, some of you remember the trilogy project that we had years ago. And I remember one of the classes, uh, it was a, a 9 o'clock Saturday morning class, and everybody was there. And it's 9 o'clock in the morning. These were our leaders from all over the country, some of our best leaders. And I asked them this question. I started the class asking this question. Is there anybody here who has not sinned today? The only person who raised their hand was John Lamferman sitting in the back of the class. <laughs> and I looked at one of the guys on the front row and I said, what have you done today? I mean, it's nine o'clock in the morning. What, what, what sin did you do? And he said, I don't know. I just figured I'd done something wrong. <laughs> and that's the sin culture that we permeate with this kind of language. It's just, we, we don't even recognize it sometimes, but there's this sense of, well, I'm a sinner, so obviously I did something wrong. And so it's like, no, 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 no. You know, it's 9 o'clock. I, and, I, and John even said, I, and, and, and I said, look, I, it's 9 o'clock. I said, I, I haven't sinned yet. So I asked, I said, can you go one minute without sinning? <laughs> well, yeah, maybe. Okay, if you can go one, can you go two? Can you go five? Can you go ten? Could you go a whole day? had never even entered their thoughts because we, 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 we inadvertently, and I think sometimes like Terry's saying, mistakenly create this culture. I'm a sinner, therefore everything I do is a sin. I just, it's just a sin. And it's not. It's not. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of righteousness. That's one of his jobs. So. Really great. That's really great. Um, Terry and Wendy both, either one or both could answer this. Um, what is your biggest 
considering the culture we live in, the world status right now, and the church, our, the status of the church, what's one of your biggest concerns as you look to the future, uh, a main concern you want to make sure that we're aware of and maybe how to address it? It could be for the church in general or for us as just leaders, a big concern you might carry for us and how to maybe address that. Can I catch Ike on that, to, just to sure. fill that out a little bit? Uh, you're speaking not just to second... Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought I had a projecting voice. My wife says I talk too loud. <laughs> uh, you're, you're speaking not just to second generation from you, but third and fourth generation leaders right here. And the distinctive values that we've been our foundation, uh, we started with these 18 values, we've been condensing them along the line, but when you look out among us, what would you say to us would be concerns or some sort of guidance or directive? Because there's a, always a tendency to slip and, and we lose those treasured things that made us what we are. I think a few spring to mind. I think that prayer is essentially the heart of, of church life. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that life has become incredibly busy and a lot of people commute to work, certainly in England. Um, their days are long, they're busy nice. Uh, and so we, we have small groups uh, we have this, we have this, we have this. And so often gathering to pray has been marginalized. We used to do it, but we can't do it anymore because life's so busy. And uh, I think that that's very serious and sad. So I think that I want to encourage us that, that leaning into God in believing prayer is the heart of who we are. We pray. Jesus prayed. And the disciples prayed because they lived with Jesus, they saw. And so for me, praying together, and sometimes it just gets touched on a little bit on the end, but I think praying together, even if it's little groups of twos and threes all around the church, or whether it's the old church, we need to, I think, not let that drift to the margins. That um, we just don't have time to pray now. We can do church, but we haven't got time to pray. Well, I think we've had it. We've, we, prayer must be fundamental, must be central to who we are. I think also, um, John's point about things moving on, I, I think sometimes we've clipped our meetings, and for good reason sometimes, because of growth and so on. So our, our time is limited. Our opportunity to be open to what God might want to do in this meeting. And, and, and maybe the prophetic and all that. I think, I think that expectation, I touched on it a little bit in the sermon, the level of expectation of encounter with God. And I think as John's talking about second, third generations, some people have been added to us who've come from other worlds who, and they've just become part of us. Now, they never, they never were in a context with an expectation of meeting with God. But I know when we first broke through as a church, it was so exciting to go to church because I wonder what will happen this week. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. I wonder what will happen. It was so exciting. Yeah. And I think that's not, that's not the norm now. Mm. People are not wondering what will happen because we know what will happen. Yeah. And so it's not a novelty in itself. It is that sense we're with God and, and the expectation of meeting with God. If, we're not, if we don't apply ourselves, we'll drift from that. So that, these, these are fundamental things. I think, I guess the other one that comes to mind to me is the fact that the culture the outside the church, you know, how can you do that in the church when this is happening in the world? And so I think the gender issue is huge. And so... Uh, that challenge about quite literally why don't you have women elders in your church because you know elder women run businesses we may have a woman prime minister in England by the time I get back um, if it is it's our third woman prime minister you know Margaret Thatcher was a great 
prime minister, you know, so why can't you? In, and so it's like, that's what the world can do, why can't we do it? But it's not like, hey, I found this Bible verse. <laughs> it's not, we haven't arrived, you don't, I haven't met anybody yet who says, oh, look, I've found a verse we haven't, here's a whole passage of verses. It's not that, it's like, they do it in the world, why can't you do it? Yeah. That's where it's coming from. And that is, that is a challenge, and certainly in the UK, and I don't know if it happens in this country, but in the UK, sometimes New Frontiers has been opposed because we don't have women elders in our churches, for instance. And why don't you, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? Well, that is not coming from the Bible. It's coming from the culture. And culture has changed. Come on, let's move on with the culture. And... Uh, uh, it's just saying, no, no, the, the Bible's different. The church is different. It's God's people, and this is the way God wants it. Now, that can be so easily caricatured that women are crushed, uh, and that is inappropriate and wrong. Uh, certainly in the churches that I've ever been with, the women are very fulfilled. They've got loads of different things that they're doing, as the men are indeed. Uh, but and, and I think a normal church life, you don't even think about it. But the elders are men because it's in the Bible. And so I think these would be uh, some of the major uh, things that concern me. Some of the spiritual things that are just drifted through, I think, busyness. Prayer being somewhat marginalized, meetings being rushed through. Uh, those, those concern me greatly. This other one comes from the culture that why don't you, well, you know, they've got a prime minister in England who's a perfectly good prime minister, a woman, why don't you have elders? You know, it's like, it's not coming from the Bible, it's coming from the culture. So I had Thomas Schreiner being interviewed by Preston Sprinkle on a thing, you may know these guys' names, and, it, and so he's pushing him and pushing him about uh, women in eldership. And, it, and, and, and Thomas Schreiner, who's a fine commentator, says, well, I could make a very good case for that. He said... He said, the problem is the Bible text. <laughs> it's like, well, the Bible doesn't say it. So, you know, you just said, well, we want to be biblical. I want to be biblical. Uh, so we've held that ground. Uh, so these, were, these are the things that spring to mind. Hey, guys. So thankful you're here. Love you guys. Uh, had a big impact on my life. Uh, I'm going to go back to the, the question Josiah actually asked, because I'm just thinking about the pastoral implications of this idea of us, you know, being dead to sin. Because when I think about, I was just thinking about this, and I'm like, what comes to mind is as a pastor, you know, I'm, I'm talking to people, and I say that, and I can just imagine the young man saying, well, if I'm dead to sin, and I'm not a sinner, why do I sin? Like, what is that just a, like, and that, so I'm thinking in my head is like, do I, cause, do I just look at that guy and say, well, it's because you're stupid? Like, you know, <laughs> like I'm, because I wouldn't even think that for myself. I'm like, I'm like, yes, I love that idea, that message of grace. Like, I am told, there's no condemnation. I'm completely free. But then it kind of bewilders me a little bit. I'm like, but I still feel temptation to sin. And I'm like, well, what, where does that come from? Does this make sense, this question? Yeah. Like, what would I, yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay I think, I think, I think so. It's perfectly Excellent question. I think that I think the whole New Testament argues it through. So it first says that you're you're not a sinner. But I mean, that's what it says by definition. You're not a sinner. You are a slave of righteousness. That's what that's the statement. That's the truth. Jesus said you should know the truth, and the truth will free you. So it's knowing truth. That's the truth. The Bible says plainly. And when, when Paul says in Romans 5, and you know about grace, then Romans 6, he says, shall we carry on sinning then? That's how he starts, chapter 6. Shall we carry on sinning then? Because, well, if God's going to call me righteous, <laughs> oh, great stuff, let's carry on sinning. They said, <laughs> then he says, by no means. No, no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Then he says, don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? You know, we, we died. And that it's, it's the preaching of that truth, not only the free gift of righteousness, but we must preach also when he died, we died. Why was I a sinner? Because I was in Adam when he sinned. That's the Bible argument. Now, I don't have any consciousness of being in Adam. I don't remember being in Adam. But the Bible says we were all in Adam when Adam sinned, we all became sinners. And he that's born of the flesh is flesh. 
So I've got to be born of the Spirit. I've got to be taken out of that and put it to somewhere else. So when I'm in Christ, he took on human form. He died. I died with him. That's how I get free, to know. Do you not know? That word know, you should know the truth. Do you not know? He that has died is freed from sin. Then the next verse, verse 12 or 13 in Romans 6 says, therefore consider yourself, reckon. And the, week, the word is sort of borrowed from the world of accountancy. Re account it, put it in the right column. Ac reckon yourself to be dead to sin. Reckon it, think it through. And I've often used the illustration when preaching that. that I, first time I ever went to overseas by, by flight, I arrived in Barcelona, and I always remember it. The, they said, welcome to our Barcelona, the time is four o'clock. I thought, it's not, it's three o'clock. That's a perfectly good watch. I haven't changed it, it's three o'clock. And he says, welcome to Barcelona, it's four o'clock. I thought the guy's an idiot. It's three o'clock. And then as you come off the plane, thank you, thank you, no, yeah, it's four o'clock. It's three o'clock, really. In Barcelona, it is four o'clock. It's a different time zone. You've got time zones across your nation. Barcelona is a different time zone to England. It is. You're in Barcelona. It is. I'm in Christ. I have died to sin. That's the truth. So change your watch. Your watch is now wrong. When you're in Christ, you are freed from sin. Change your thinking. Your watch is wrong. You're in Barcelona. Your thinking is wrong. You are in Christ. Change it. That's what Paul argues. First know it, then reckon it. Then he says this. Give no opportunity for your members, the members of your body. He said that our old... I should have brought my Bible up with me. He says that your... Let sin not reign in your mortal body. Your mortal body. Why does he say mortal? Because my body is not yet immortal. All right, I've got an immortal soul. My body is yet to be saved. Romans 8, the adoption of our body. We get a new body one day. Hallelujah, that's good news for me. A new body one day. <laughs> that's, that's future salvation. A new body as well. Meanwhile, I've got a new man living in an old body. That's what the Bible teaches. I've got a new man living in an old body. Now he says, don't give the members of your body to sin as an instrument. When we worship, we pick up instruments. It doesn't come on from nowhere. We pick up an instrument. Sin is looking for an instrument. And if you can use your hands like you used to, or your eyes like you used to, or your speech like you used to, you're giving your members to sin. Stop doing it. So to live the godly life, first of all, we must know it's true because God says it's true. Secondly, we reckon it's true. I'm in Barcelona now. Time's changed. I'm in Christ now. I reckon it. I account it. I reckon it. I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind. I line up with that truth and I take responsibility. So we still take responsibility for our members that are waiting for salvation. I'm still living in this flesh. I take responsibility for it. So it says in the Proverbs, the wise man does not go down the path of a prostitute in the Proverbs. So you might say, well, that's the quickest way. I want to get from A to B. A prostitute lives down that road, but that's the quickest way. And the Proverbs says the wise man doesn't go down there. He goes another way. So you keep making good choices. You say, no, I'm not going that way. I'm not going to get into that context because I still have flesh. So I, I'm a new man, and I'm living in, I'm living in this flesh. No, but I don't, I don't give it ground. I put to death. That's the language of the Scripture. I put it to death, not having that. So we're still responsible for making decisions. I'm a new man. I'm a new creature. I'm in Christ. I'm living in a mortal body that used to touch things it shouldn't have touched, used to say things it shouldn't have said, used to look at stuff it shouldn't have. Now I'm a new person, and I live from this new person. I take responsibility. So that to me, see some people say, well just let go and let God. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It's a step by step. This is, these are the way, this is how we do it. So we've got to teach it. So, because it's not just vague, well we're all just sinners anyway. That's a cheap way. 
It isn't true. And so, but you've got to believe what God says is true so that we step into liberty. And we still take responsibility for ourselves. So I do pray, don't leave me there. Deliver me from it. Because I know it's out there. The world, the flesh, and the devil, it's all out there. I don't want to go there. So I'm asking God, don't take me there. Deliver me from it. And so, yeah, there's the battle of faith. But it's not a battle with my soul. I'm not still a sinner. It's not my instinct. I'm not that person. I'm a new person. I'm a born of God. And, and it says in Galatians 5.16, if you walk in the Spirit, so we've got to be Spirit-filled. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And the will not there is a double negative, which you can't use in English. You can't, you can't use a double neg negative in English. You, have, you can't not, not to it, you know. <laughs> but in, in, and so Ben Witherington, who's a fine commentator, he says, you could translate it, certainly not. If you walk in the Spirit, you will certainly not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the importance of being full of the Spirit is ever so real. We, the Holy Spirit will give us victory and enjoyment of the Spirit. So it's the truth of what happened at the cross in Christ. These Romans 6, if you like, truths, plus life in the Spirit. Hey, this is, this is what God wants for us. So that, those, so, but... Yeah, I think we just got to keep on teaching the, what, the, what the, the epistles particularly say. Okay. I just want to, just want to sum this up because I, this is just one of those things that's been, it's you know, I mean, I think we've all thought about this for a long time. But so essentially saying like we are fully redeemed, we are not sinners, but we live in a flesh waiting to be re fully redeemed, the flesh itself, mm -hmm. but our souls and us, thus our identity is fully in Christ. Yeah. Would that be a correct articulation? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> hey, Terry, I really appreciate all the insights that you're sharing. And uh, it really spoke to me earlier when you mentioned about not letting busyness uh, crowd out prayer life and that type of thing. And one of the thoughts that came to mind was, for, well, just to be... Uh, transparent. I've got four kids, so busyness, a, a non-busy life, life sounds wonderful, and I don't know how to achieve it. So um, it just is crazy. But uh, in the midst of, of kids and leadership demands, how do you uh, carve out time for prayer and lead into spiritual gifts being released in the church that you're in? I think I'm hearing half the question, maybe. How do you carve out time for prayer? We can perhaps come back to work. Yeah, yeah, and then having all the gifts of the Spirit being released in your church and not letting busyness crowd it out. Yeah, okay, I think the two things. I think, I don't, I don't think you, I think you have to make time to pray. I don't think prayer just happens. And so the difference, I think it's an important thing. Um, I'm talking personal prayer now, I hope that's covering. That I think the difference between legalism and discipline is very important. So if you talk about prayer, people can, you feel, oh dear, prayer, condemnation, I'm not very good at it. Uh, and so we feel kind of, oh, wish I was a better prayer. I begin to, now I better apply myself legalistically. Now legalism is trying to earn points. It's trying to establish your own righteousness. That legalism, its motivation is to, look, I'm doing better. Are you happy with me now, God? I'm trying to get happy with myself. I may be trying to impress other people. It's all external. I'm doing this for the wrong reasons. Discipline is something I choose to do for myself. I want to do it. I discipline myself. So uh, I think we did a question time the other day when Wendy was saying, Terry's very religious about keeping Monday as our day. But I, it's not legalism, it's discipline. We keep Monday as our day. Um, no, I, I do that because I love her. I want to be with her. It's not, it's not to try and impress anybody else. But if I don't do that discipline, I can go away for preaching. I preach for weekends very often. And people say, well, you preach Sunday night, you can go home Monday. Because you don't do anything Mondays, do you? So I said, no, I do. I spend my Monday. So I would fight for Monday. Not because of legalism, but because of discipline and love. So, so discipline is not legalistic. It can be a loving decision. I'm going to do this thing because I don't want to drift. 
I don't want our relationship to drift. I want to protect it, so I'll be disciplined about it. So prayer, you have to, you have to pick up, you have to have some disciplines, um, and they're not legalistic. It's not I'm trying to earn points. It's because I want it. But if I don't fight for it, I can lose it. And so I will fight for my, my discipline. So when I was at Bible college, my, 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 I saw guys, we used to share rooms at Bible college. And you know, you can't apparently go to Bible college to get all ready to serve God. And the number of guys who lost God before Christmas in their first term, because they shared rooms and they, they never had time to pray. And, and I mean, a number of guys that just lost the Lord. Uh, and they didn't fellowship with him. And so I, I would look at my friends every, every semester, I think you would call them, um, I'd look at his timetable and look at my timetable. I'd say, right, he's in a lecture, then I'm not. He's in a lecture, then I'm not. He's in a lecture, then I'm not. Right, my room is empty, then. I'm, fine. I'm having that, then. Because I've got to find my time. And so I, I was... I was disciplined. I must have my prayer time. I want my, not for legalism, but for my sake. I want it. I want answers to prayer. I want to get to know God. And so you fight for prayer. And so when we, I was leading the church at uh, Brighton, and once, when I joined them, there was, they were, I had a prayer meeting on Sunday nights, once a month. And I thought, well, I like to pray before the weekend, because lots happen on the Sunday. I want to pray on the Saturday rather than Sunday night. So the prayer meeting began to hot up. It began to be a quite lively thing to do. It was getting good. <laughs> and uh, so we doubled it up twice a month on a Sunday night. But then I wanted it before. The, so I said, we're going to pray now. The prayer meeting's changing to 8 o'clock Saturday morning every week. And I think, I think I, you know, I'm trying to learn as a shepherd, are the flock, how, how are the flock? <laughs> How's the temperature? Is there people, how, what's going to happen? Well, I said, it's going to be Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. Well, it's kind of, oh, Saturday morning. That's the only morning I get to lie in. Oh, come on. Every time. Well, they started coming. And it grew and grew and grew. And guys would say I would never have missed it. And I mean, people like Matt Hosey, I heard him say, I learned to pray at that prayer meeting. And uh, it, it, I, you had to tie, I had to learn. Are the people ready for this? Will, will I be the only person there? You know. Uh, but I, I thought we got the timing right, and it came alive. And it's like, no, we're going to do this thing. So I think disciplines, you, with, with, on your own, you've got to learn your own. I, I, I was hugely impressed by a man called J.O. Fraser, who was a missionary to China. Terrific. If you can ever read it, Behind the Ranges, or his daughter wrote another book, Rain from Heaven, I think it's called. Mountain Rain. Mountain Rain. Thank you so much. Yeah, terrific. And as much of it's his letters home, he learned to pray, he saw terrific things happen. But he said, find your best time. So for me, my best time is the morning. For some people, their best time is the evening. Uh, you know, you, you, I used to come alive in the evening, I don't know anymore, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm okay in the morning. So I think for young mums, you know, the morning's the worst possible time. Kids, ah, you know, you've got to find your time, maybe. Um, but give your best time because you want to. So you, sometimes you have to fight for that. Yeah, can I just give a brief illustration of that? I remember as a young mum, we have five children, but at the time I had four and the youngest was a baby and we had just moved to a new town, to Brighton, much bigger location. We were kind of starting out planting this church I had, we, we couldn't afford a nice house, so it was either a tiny house or a very old, large house. And we bought the very old, decaying large house, which was not a good idea. But we were always having people to stay because we got X number of rooms. And um, my, my three uh, other children were all uh, little children. I had to take them to school and back. And we had one car, so it meant walking there and back with the baby cooking everything else, you know how it is, and trying to plant this church. And I remember once thinking, I haven't prayed for three days and feeling so guilty and thinking, I'm the pastor's wife and I haven't prayed. And I just thought, it's impossible. You know, I'm up in the night feeding the baby 
and, uh, and everything else. And, and you ba I barely sat down from one day to the next and I was so tired. And I remember feeling so guilty that I hadn't prayed. And then I got a half hour slot one afternoon before I had to fetch the kids from school. And I remember dragging myself up the stairs to my bedroom and kind of rehearsing this prayer. Well, Lord, I'm coming to see you. Um, I haven't been for a while because I've got all these children that you gave me. <laughs> and I'm looking after them. I'm trying to do my best. And uh, I'm dragged. Got to my bedroom, got on my knees, and immediately, I mean, God is so gracious. I had a vision. And I saw this very strong wooden big old door and it was slightly ajar. And I kind of went up to this door and peeped round it thinking, ooh, is he behind there? And I saw this long, long room and there's a kind of a platform at the end with a throne on it. And I'm thinking, I've got to go all the way up there <laughs> to talk to him. And you know, while I'm standing, peeping round the door, this person jumps off the throne. I always, always makes me cry. <laughs> he jumped off the throne and ran down the room with his arms open. And he said, where have you been? I've missed you. And it was not hard to pray after that. <laughs> but I learned that I had to form a new way of relating to the Lord, that I had to talk to him in the things I was doing while I'm feeding the baby, while I'm going to the supermarket in the car, while I'm walking to the school to meet the children, while I'm cleaning the bathroom. I talk to him. I learned to do that. And now life's, it's in a different season and you have to read the times and the seasons. And now I love to pray with Terry every day, most days. And it's that season of life where we have more leisure. We can pray at length for our kids and around the world and everybody else, <laughs> and you lot too. <laughs> um, it's a different season. And I think wives need to be very careful they don't get under condemnation. Of the, because I'm the leader's wife, I have to keep up an image, even to myself. You, you need to actually relate to Jesus. And he wants to walk with you in your life. So, uh, yeah, that's what I learned. Hi, um, I have two questions. First, I want to say your first session that you did from Ezra this morning was incredibly helpful. And, um, but you said something about that thinking of don't look at the church, look at Jesus. And I think that comes from a legit, probably a legitimate place of like pain that people have experienced. I know my husband and I are pastoring a lot of people who have experienced abuse from within a church or hurt from within a church. So I want to first ask, how do you help and pastor people um, who have been hurt by the church? And then second, um, how do you guard yourself from discouragement when you see the beautiful vision of the church that's set out in the New Testament, and then maybe you see where you are now currently. Um, so yeah, those are the questions I have. Yeah, I think uh, the first thing, uh, we'll come back to the second thing, perhaps, but how do you help people being hurt by the church? Right? I think, in the, it, to be honest, you've got to try and diffuse the idea of the church. You've got to come to who hurt you? Because I think people, it's one of the reasons I would say try not to use the word new frontiers or the word confluence. Try to stick to people. Uh, and so, you know, Brian Maury helps us. Then you've got a people. If you don't like Brian Maury, either you need to repent or Brian needs to repent. If it's confluence, no one has to repent. Because what's confluence? I don't know. I don't like it. No, no, no one has to repent. Now, if you say the church, what, what would you mean the church? Who? So we've got to help people. So what, what, what did she say? What did he say? Do you think you need to speak to her or to him? And, and you know, so, so there are biblical principles. If someone sins against you, you go to them. 
and talk to them. If they, if they don't receive you, maybe take someone with you. And, and so I think that kind of language, I was, the church hurt me. It's just, it isn't, it isn't real. The church doesn't hurt you. Somebody did, perhaps. And therefore, let's get to that person. Or let's, what, what is your problem with that person? Because then there can come some repentance one way or the other, or some understanding of one another. So I, th I would try and diffuse the language, the church did this to me, because it actually doesn't. Somebody did it. So we've got to try and find out who and what. So that would, no, I'm sorry, that's, that would be my, the first one. And what, and what was the other one? Yeah, I think I think that um, it says it says fight hot fight the good fight of faith. So that's where the the fight is fought in the realm of faith. That's what the Bible says. So it's a, so we have to fight that fight, and it says lay hold of the the lay hold of the gift that God's given us. So it, I think it is holding on to God what He said to us what we believe in him for. If he said this is going to happen, we hold on to that. I think we thank God for that. It says in the scriptures, abound in thanksgiving. Uh, this is the will of God that you give thanks and so on. So I think thanksgiving is an important step towards holding on. It's, it's, it's all, but you know, the old song, count your blessings. And it is, it is genuinely thanking him, praising him, believing him. And I mean, that delay is another thing. I think sometimes faith, people think faith is a now thing. If you had faith, you'd take it now. But lots of Bible, if you, after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Those who through faith and patience inherited the promise. So faith and patience are often put together in the Bible. Whereas we tend to put faith and now. No, nothing wrong with faith and now, hallelujah. Uh, but... Faith and patience is often in the Bible. So sometimes you just got to hang in there. And I, I, I always think of the story of Joshua when he was, I mean, Joseph, when Joseph was told, you know, your brothers will bow down and so on, and, and you will have a, 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 a regal kind of role. Uh, and everything goes worse and worse and worse. Uh, everything, you know, he's far from his brothers, he's in a foreign country and his brothers are miles away, and he's got these promises. And then two guys are thrown into prison with him, and they say, we had a dream. And I think if, if I was Joseph, I'd say, yeah, I used to have dreams, forget it. You know, that's what put me in prison, having a dream. But he doesn't, he says, tell me your dream. And I think he's still believing. Well, you know, well done, you're still believing. And so sometimes faith, it talks about the trial of faith, the testing of your faith, more precious than gold. And so faith gets tried. Uh, delay is a, a big one. And it's holding on, believing what he says, thanking him for it. And it says about Abraham, he grew strong in faith as he gave praise and glory to God. I think if I was Abraham and the years, and she's getting older and I'm getting older and she's barren anyway, you know, I think the, the years are slipping by I'm going to get weaker in faith. But it says about Abraham, he grew strong in faith, giving praise and glory to God, fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was well able to perform. I found that when I was living by faith, and at the beginning of my first less secular work, that was a verse that I'd lived on, that he grew strong in faith, fully persuaded that what God had promised, he's well able. God wouldn't have promised it if he couldn't do it. It's not like, oh, I was going to do it. I didn't realize you were so old. You know? <laughs> oh, Abraham, you look such a good guy. You're older than I realized. You know? Oh, she's barren. I hadn't thought of that. No, you know, fully persuaded what he promised he's able to do. And you have to kind of preach to yourself. You know, you preach to yourself. You fight the fight of faith. That's been my experience. Okay. We're going to... One more question for the youngest guy here who can feed himself. What's that? You don't know that? How old are you? Anybody got 22 feet younger? Okay. The second youngest guy here has a question. 
Thank you. First of all, I just want to say that it's a huge honor to be here among all of these great leaders and to, to learn from you guys. But I would ask both of you, um, is there any encouragement that you would give uh, to young leaders as, as young men and women who are, uh, I know, in this room and stepping into leadership? And uh, it can be intimidating and scary, and uh, you can really get straight into the deep end pretty quickly. So uh, I would love to hear any encouragement that you have uh, from either of you guys. Wow, um, I can't remember what it's like to be young. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think to uh, put your roots down into God, really. I think I, I think the principles. Reading biographies and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I did find that terrifically helpful. Yes, I did. I think. I think for myself, the, the, the simple basics stick with. I know for myself, Wendy's just reminded me of how very, very helped I was reading Christian biography. And uh, I, I, was, I was very changed as a, I, I had a crisis of conviction of sin to walk away from my old world and try and be a Christian. But I, don't know how, I didn't know how to be a Christian. Um, my parents were not Christian. Um, I didn't know any Christians close up. Uh, and so I, I used to commute by train every day. Uh, and I used to play cards. I played three card brag. I used to win quite a lot of money. But I stopped all that. And so I started reading biography. And I read, first one was a guy called Jungle Pilot, who... Um, flew the five Ecuador martyrs, Jim Elliott, these guys, it was quite big news at the time. These five young Americans had gone to the mission field or got slaughtered. And uh, he wrote his story and I, I found it so inspiring that a man who was probably, I don't know, just a decade older than I was, wow, what a life. And then I read about Jim Elliott, and I read about C.T. Studd, and I read about Hudson Taylor. I just found reading Christian biography was massively inspiring. Uh, thank God these lives were just amazing people. And they were my kind of age, so I thought, wow, you know, I could sit for God. And I think biography then gradually getting into, I guess, more theology. I started reading, I read Packer, Knowing God, John Stott, The Cross of Christ, and getting hold of truth, really get into truth. I find that really, really... I found books of solid theology more inspiring than devotional books, if I can make such a broad brushstroke. I found Knowing God hugely inspiring by J.I. Packer. The Cross of Christ by John Stott, hugely inspiring. So getting in, getting your teeth into theology helped me a lot. And so I would, I would, I found biography got me going because I was a non-reader before. I was not a reader. Uh, my parents never read to me as a child. I mean, Wendy read with our kids a lot, so they get they like reading. It's such a great thing to do with children to read with them. So they get they like to read. And I never was taught to read. Uh, you know, I didn't. I wasn't a reader. So as a Christian, I'm so grateful. Christian biography, and then more and more into doctrine that fed me. Uh, so I'm reading about revival inspired for more. Uh, so, I think these were some of the early ingredients. I'm not sure if that's really scratching where you're itching, but I, that to me was hugely unhelpful. Yeah. <laughs>